Now I have the privilege of introducing the best boss that anybody could ever have, appearing at his second real estate conference, the Dean of the Miami Business School, John Quelch. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, it's been a wonderful day so far, thanks to uh, Professor Hewson and uh, the many others who've made this uh, program possible. It's a remarkable occasion every year on our calendar, uh, the Real Estate Impact Conference. I really appreciate everybody in the room attending, coming from near and far for this very important event. Uh, thanks to all of the sponsors and indeed to all of the faculty members at the three schools uh, who combine to make this uh, wonderful occasion a reality each year. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to uh, introduce on behalf of uh, my colleagues from the schools of architecture and law, uh, the president of the University of Miami, uh, Dr. Julio Frank. Uh, many of you know uh, Julio by now. Uh, he is uh, first and foremost uh, a physician, um, and a physician who chose to make society his patient as a practitioner of public health. Um, if you think about it for a moment, uh, the, the strides that have been made in global public health over the last century have uh, brought life and comfort to more billions of people than perhaps any other field of human endeavor. And so we're especially proud to uh, have him uh, a public health uh, leader as our president. Uh, as you may know, he was formerly the Minister of Health in Mexico, uh, then became the Dean of the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard University, uh, and is now our president. Just one last uh, word of introduction, if I may, because the bio is brilliant, but it's also a little bit uh, tedious. When I talk to parents, parents of our students at the University of Miami, um, I ask them, well, why, why did your son, why did your daughter come here? Uh, and of course, they have some uh, occasional comments regarding the quality of the curriculum or they've heard of a particular department and so on. But the most, the most frequent comment that I hear is, well, we learnt a little bit about the president of the University of Miami and we want to feel comfortable and we do feel comfortable trusting our sons and daughters to someone with that level of humanity, with those values. And that is, I think, what sets our president apart. Uh, we can uh, go through the motions of uh, uh, curriculum design, we can go through the motions of uh, administrative improvement, uh, but in the final analysis, we all want to be led by someone who has values that we believe in. And our parents and our students are truly blessed, along with the faculty and staff, to have Julio Frank as our leader. Please welcome Julio Frank. Thank you, John. That's the nicest introduction I have ever gotten. Wow. Uh, the, <laughs> the truth of the matter is that it is an incredible privilege to be president of, uh, of a university with such amazing um, critical mass of talent, talent among our brilliant students, our uh, incredibly outstanding faculty and our devoted staff. And it's a job where you, know, you get to interact with smart devoted, smart, devoted people every, every single day. And part of that is reflected in this great conference. Um, I do believe that one of the functions of universities is to act as conveners uh, institutions that actually help to bring people from very different paths, from academia, but also from industry, and from government, and from civil society, and members of the community at large, and bring them together to analyze and discuss and reflect on critical issues of our times affecting our societies. And conferences like this allow us to, uh, to do exactly that. 
the other value we uh, are emphasizing at the University of Miami is the value of interdisciplinary collaboration. Because problems do not uh, organize themselves in the same silos in which we organize our schools and our departments. And this conference is again a great example of that. It brings our students and faculty together with professionals, with recent alumni, with leaders in the different areas of uh, real estate. And, and it creates that space for convening and dialogue among people with different pathways, but focused on a common theme. And it does that with an interdisciplinary focus. Because as you just heard, this conference is co-hosted by the Miami Business School, the School of Architecture, and our law school. So it brings thought leaders from very different uh, fields to share best practices. Today, I have the enormous pleasure and privilege of introducing an amazing thought leader, uh, New, New York Times bestselling author and journalist, uh, Malcolm Gladwell. We're really, really very grateful to uh, Malcolm Gladwell for his willingness to share his insights with uh, the, our students, who I'm sure will be greatly inspired, and everyone who's attending this conference. <clears throat> Malcolm Gladwell has been a staff writer for The New Yorker, since 1996. He is also the host of the pod podcast Revisionist History and co-founder co of the podcast uh, company Pushkin Industries. Now, as I know everyone in this room knows, he has written a number of books, five books over the past 20 years to truly international acclaim. And I was telling him that, you know, the thing I love are first of all, the titles. You read the title of the book and you say, this has got to be a super interesting book. And then the subtitles, the subtitles make it even more enticing. And then of course, you're drawn into the book by the title and the subtitle, and then you find that it is indeed a brilliant piece of, uh, of insightful analysis. You know most of these um, names or titles of books, The Tipping Point, subtitle, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference, Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking, Outliers, The Story of Success, and then this one, What the Dog Saw, and Other Adventures, which is a collection of his journalism. Uh, and then uh, in 2013, David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. I mean, the titles themselves are a literary masterpiece. He tells us that he's writing now or finishing a new book, so I can't wait um, to, to read that one as well. All of these five books were on the New York bestsellers uh, list. He's been lauded by business leaders and criticals alike and his books have been loved by, by, by both business leaders and critics alike. And both the books and the articles often deal with the unexpected implications of research in the social sciences, particularly in the areas of psychology, social psychology, and one of my own fields of study, which is sociology. And of course, in The Tipping Point, he also uses a lot of my other field, which is in, in public health and epidemiology. It is very fitting that Mr. Gladwell would share his expertise with students, as I understand that his own curiosity and love of learning was encouraged when his father, a professor of mathematics and engineering, allowed a young Malcolm to wander around offices at a university, the University of Waterloo, as he was telling me, in Canada. So truly an outstanding, exceptional individual with a level of insight that I think has inspired many of us Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. It's a, uh, it's a real pleasure to be asked to speak at this conference. I'd like to thank uh, Vanessa Grout for inviting me and um, to come to Miami from New York in February. Uh, <laughs> not nearly as hard as it sounds. I apologize, I'm not, I, I, you know, I, I'm massively underdressed. I assumed with the kind of um, uh, typical New Yorker snobbery that in Miami everyone would be in flip-flops <laughs> and poolside and uh, I thought I would try and uh, blend in by dressing as I did, but I, I appear to have made Terrible mistake. Um, <laughs> I'm also reminded whenever I, I come to Miami of, uh, I, I once went to, to Dubai just before the, uh, um, the financial crisis when Dubai was at its kind of height of craziness and the 
cab driver took me from the airport to my hotel and he couldn't find the hotel and we circled around and around and around and around and finally we found it and he turned to me very apologetically and he said, um, I swear it wasn't there a month ago. Um, <laughs> that's what I think of whenever I come to Miami. Um, you're very well done on your part. Um, I, I'm not, um, I know that this is a, a conference sponsored by the business school and the architecture school, um, but I'm not going to talk about directly about um, either business or architecture because I have a rule that says that um, I never talk about something that my audience knows more about than I do. Um, this, I actually learned this the hard way. I uh, once gave a, there's a school, this is a digression, there'll be a number of these. Um, there's a grad school in Manhattan called Rockefeller, which is a, the most, probably one of the most elite uh, science graduate schools in the world. There's just an, like, an unbelievable number of their faculty are Nobel Prize winners. And they started this speaking uh, series where they would bring in people, um, outsiders, to come and address their faculty and students, basically lambs for the slaughter. And I was one of the lambs. And I gave this talk, and I foolishly, in the middle of the talk, started talk going on and on about some missile from the 60s. And at the end of the conference, some little guy raises his hand, and he still has the German accent, and he says, with respect to your mentioning of the missile something something from 1960s, you are 100% incorrect. How do I know this? Because I designed the missile. <laughs> uh, you never really recover from an experience like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm just not gonna talk about architecture or real estate development at all. Um, uh, I'm going to go off on, on a, a little bit of a diagonal um, away from the nuts and bolts of this conference. Um, but I do want to talk about something that is conceptually of interest, I think, to all of you. Um, I want to talk about buildings and streets and neighborhoods, but I want to talk about their psychological and social implications. Now, that seems like a little bit of a strange topic, I don't, because we don't think of buildings and neighborhoods and streets as having psychological implications. We think of people as having psychological implications. Buildings are inert, right? They're, they're, they are concrete and steel and wood. They don't possess characteristics and traits like people do. Um, but I think that's actually a mistake and that uh, there is something to be said for thinking about the built environment um, in this way, looking through the lens of, 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 of psychology. And um, I want to give you two examples of what I mean by this, or what I mean, what it means to look at the built environment through this kinds of lens. And uh, the first involves uh, a man named David Weisberg. David Weisberg is uh, a criminologist. He's probably one of the most important criminologists of the 20th century. He, um, he won the Criminologists have their own version of the Nobel Prize, which he won a couple years ago. Um, uh, and he, by the way, it's sort of lovely that they have their own version of the Nobel Prize. Um, if you were smart and you were doing your own version of the Nobel Prize, you would also call it the Nobel Prize. I mean, why not? Like, why not just, anyway, side. Um, they don't have a monopoly on the word Nobel, right? You can just call it the, uh, anyway, he's a criminologist and he starts out, he graduates from, uh, Yale University with his PhD, and he uh, gets a job working on a project in New York City. Um, and it's a pilot project in the 72nd Precinct in Brooklyn. Now, I don't know how many of you know your Brooklyn, but the 72nd Precinct is south of Greenwood Cemetery, uh, parts of Sunset Park, and east of the docks. So in the 1970s, when he was invited to do this pilot project there, that would have been one of the worst neighborhoods in New York. It's still not a great neighborhood, but it's been gentrifying pretty dramatically. But in the uh, mid-1970s, it would be about as bad an urban neighborhood as existed um, in the United States. Um, you know, in the backyards of apartment buildings, there would be five feet of trash. If you walk through a hallway of an apartment building, they would be, you know, he. Weisberg remembers refrigerators in the hallway and rats running free. I mean, just about as horrendous a place as you could possibly imagine. And what the 
NYPD was doing was they decided, they wanted to see whether if they had street patrols of uh, two officers, street patrols, um, that would change the level of crime in the neighborhood and also affect the attitude of the people in the neighborhood t before the, uh, towards the police. And Weisberg's job was to accompany the beat officers as they walked around the 72nd and to make notes, to sort of observe whether these cops were making any, any kind of difference. So he does this five days a week, eight hours a day, for an entire year with nine separate beat officers in the 72nd. So he gets an exposure to this neighborhood of a sort that most of us never get to a, an urban neighborhood. And he's all dressed up in his suit and tie and he's got his notepad and everyone thinks he's a detective and he has to always tell them, no, I'm actually a grad student. Um, big difference between those two states. And he, uh, now what he had been taught in grad school uh, about crime were two things, and they're the same things, the kind of conventional wisdom that all of us think when we, most of us think when we think about crime. The first thing that he had been taught was that crime is linked to major social problems, right? It's a function of poverty, of drugs, of unemployment, of discrimination, and wherever you have those kinds of broad social problems, you would have crime. And every city in the world, major city in the world, had an area where, which they referred to as their high crime area, which was an area where uh, those five social problems existed in some large degree, right? So uh, New York had places like the 72nd Precinct in the South Bronx, Los Angeles had South Central, Miami had Overton, uh, London had Brixton, Paris had the outer boroughs. I mean, I could go on, the outer, uh, the outer um, suburbs, I could go on. Crime, the idea was, was linked to these troubled neighborhoods. And the second part of the, of the orthodoxy was about criminals. Criminals were presumed to be, and this is Weisberg's phrase, he said he was taught that criminals were like Dracula. They were people who had a overwhelming strong motivation to commit crimes. These were people who had powerful impulses. They were being driven by addiction, by mental illness, by greed, by uh, despair by anger and that meant that they would go to extraordinary lengths to uh, commit the crimes to do the things that they desired uh, to do so if crime belongs to communities and criminals are like Dracula driven by these powerful motivations of greed and despair and addiction and mental illness then crime should be everywhere in the 72nd precinct right 72nd Precinct is about as bombed out an area of New York as you can imagine in the mid-70s. So you would expect that as Weisberg walked the streets of the 72nd day in, day out for that entire year, he and his patrol officer partner should be encountering crime everywhere, right? Wrong. They don't encounter crime everywhere. He's walking these streets every day for an entire year, and what he discovers is that the only places they see crime are a very, very small number of streets. They are spending all of their time reacting to problems, not throughout the neighborhood. In fact, they never go to 90% of the neighborhood. They're spending the same, all of their time on just a few short street segments over and over and over again. And by the end of the year, he turns to his police officer partners and he says, why do we even bother worrying about the rest of the neighborhood. Forget it. This crime's all in this one or two or three or four uh, spots over and over again. Now, <clears throat> it's important to understand what a weird notion this is, right? Criminals have, have legs, they have cars, they have bicycles, they have subway tokens, they have all, you know, they're driven by strong impulses. Why on earth would they be confining their activities to just a few choice blocks over and over again, right? Why wouldn't they, if they were in search of a car to break into or a person to mug and they couldn't find a car or a person on one block, why wouldn't they just move two blocks over? What he was observing made absolutely no sense. But after an entire year of making these observations, Weisberg began to think that something about the orthodoxy about that he had been taught about crime was wrong. So then he gets a job at uh, Rutgers. And Rutgers in this period had, um, still does, had one of the uh, most innovative criminology departments in the uh, country. And he decides that what he wants to do is to test out this 
theory empirically. Is what he saw in the 72nd precinct just a weird function of Brooklyn, or is it true everywhere? So he decides he wants to do an experiment, and it's sort of hard to do because if you think about it, back in those years, when crime was reported, it was recorded by precinct. You would say we had a murder in the 72nd precinct or the 68th precinct or a murder in this part of Miami or that part of Miami. It didn't come with a street address, right? We never, it never occurred to us that that was a relevant fact. But he really wants to see how crime occurs by on, a level, on, a, on the highest level of specificity possible. He wants to know what block it occurred on. So he had to find a police office, a police department that would give him access to that kind of data. And finally, he uh, finds a very um, uh, forward-looking police chief in Minneapolis who agrees to let him uh, see the street-coded crime data for Minneapolis. And what Weisberg does is, remember this is the 80s before we had computerized Google Maps, he puts on the wall of his office a giant map of Minneapolis, blown up about as, hot, as much as you can blow up a, uh, a street map of the city. And for two years, every time there is a crime of any significance in Minneapolis, he puts a pin in the map, right? And at the end of the two-year period, he takes a step back and takes a look at the map. And what does he see? He sees that Minneapolis, which has all kinds of bad neighborhoods, that crime does not occur in the bad neighborhoods of Minneapolis. What crime? A crime occurs on a very small number of streets scattered throughout the entire city. In fact, by his calculations, 3.3% of the street segments, a street segment is not the whole block, just the half of a block, 3.3% of the street segments in Minneapolis account for 50% of the crime in the entire city, which is a, I mean, it's hard today to kind of conjure up the kind of awe and excitement and disbelief that that uh, finding caused in the mid-1980s, but it blew people's minds. There wasn't a single person in the field of criminology who expected to find that result. It made no sense. Right? So Weisberg said, all right, let's see, maybe this is something that is specific to the 72nd Precinct and Minneapolis. Maybe Minneapolis, maybe because they're all Scandinavian, it's weird over there, right? So they decided, let's try it other cities. So they did Boston. Boston, what did they find? 3.6% of the street segments in Boston account for 50% of the crime in Boston. They did Kansas City, same thing. They did Seattle, same thing. They did Dallas, same thing. Every single city they did it, they did this analysis for in the United States returned exactly the same result. That less than 5% of the street segments in the city are responsible for over 50% of the crime. So then he thinks, okay, maybe this is an American phenomenon. Let's go overseas. So he starts doing going overseas. He goes, he's Israeli, so he says, I'll do Tel Aviv. You can't imagine a place more different from Minneapolis than Tel Aviv, right? On the continuum, Tel Aviv is here, Minneapolis is over here. Scandinavians, Ashkenazi Jews, right? Big difference. So he goes to Tel Aviv. What does he discover? Exactly the same thing. 3.5% or 3.4% of of street, city street segments are responsible for 50% of the crime. There has never been a major urban center that has been studied along these lines that has not returned the exact same result. And in fact, this phenomenon now has a name. It's called the law of criminal concentration. And it is a law. It is an absolute principle that in any urban area, a tiny fraction of the street segments account for the overwhelming majority of the crime. Now, what does this mean, the law of criminal concentration? Well, we know a couple of interesting things about it. Um, the first is that uh, this, the handful of streets that account for the overwhelming majority of crime are pretty stable. So it wouldn't be all that interesting if we said that 3% of the streets in, in Miami, of the blocks in Miami account for 50% of the crime in any given year, but those 3% change every year. They're constantly mutating. That's not an interesting finding. What we find is the opposite, that the same streets show up year after year after year. So I'm going to show you a map. Uh, let me pull up the first slide. Uh, what I'm about to show you is 
This is a map that Weisberg made of Seattle. And what you see is just what he's talking about, which is that uh, Seattle has, you see that uh, each dot represents a street segment um, where uh, there are what he calls a hot spot, which is one of those street segments that um, has an overwhelmingly greater amount of crime than the rest of the city. And what you see is in the downtown core, obviously where the population density is very high, um, you have a lot of hot spots. But throughout the rest of the city, there are no bad neighborhoods. There are only bad street segments scattered almost at random throughout the residential areas of Seattle. Now, that much would be expected under the law of criminal concentration. The really interesting thing is that that map is 10 years old. And if I showed you the map from 2018 for Seattle, it would look almost identical to that. These places don't move. Right? They are extraordinarily stable from year to year. Now, second thing, what happens if you crack down on a hotspot? What happens if you say, okay, well, if all of my crime is on 3% of my city streets, shouldn't I just deploy all my police resources to those 3%, right? So what happens when you do that? Now, the assumption of people in law enforcement is, if you do that, then all you'll do is move the hotspot, right? You crack down on one block where you think there's a lot of crime, the criminals are just going to walk to the next block in response, right? So Weisberg says, is this true? Let's figure out whether this is true. That phenomenon is called displacement, by the way. So what he wants to do is to, is to figure out, is there displacement? So he does an experiment. And if you could bring up the next slide. This is an experiment done in Jersey City. And the pink area in the middle, the triangular area in the middle, is an area of Jersey City where for many years there had been a prostitution hotspot. So basically most of the uh, sex work in, uh, uh, open air sex work in uh, Jersey City occurred in that six block by six block triangle. So what Weisberg does is he decides, he just convinces the Jersey City Police Department to put 10 officers on permanent patrol in that six by six block area. Now, if you know anything about, as I'm sure you do, about policing, you'll know that putting 10 extra officers in a six block by six block area is huge. That's like you can't walk down the street without seeing a police officer. That is an insane level of law enforcement presence. Basically, he says, flood that area with as many cops as you can find. And then he adds all kinds of other, he gives them extra resources and he fast tracks pro um, prosecution. Basically, he makes that the most heavily policed area of Jersey City in the history of Jersey City. Right? And he tells the cops, by the way, you cannot leave the six block by six block area. You can't leave the, the pink triangle. You, you stop at the border, right? And so he wants to see, well, what happens? Well, the first thing that happens is really logical, which is that prostitution falls by two thirds, right? He puts them all out of business. Right? Okay, so then this, his second question is, what happens to those prostitutes who are no longer working inside the pink triangle? Do they respond to this crackdown simply by moving into either the dark blue area or even the pale blue area right outside? I mean, all they have to do is walk two blocks and there's no more cops, right? It's normal Jersey City rules, which is anything goes. They, you know, it takes them a couple of weeks to understand the cops are like literally going to the edge of the border and stopping, right? So if they want to continue their work, they have to walk two blocks. And what he wants to know is, will they walk two blocks, right? Displacement theory would say, yeah, they'll walk two blocks. Of course they will. They're rational actors, right? They want to keep doing their business. What, it is, what does he discover? They don't walk two blocks. There's no displacement. The prostitutes do not move outside of the pink triangle. And he, I, I'm going to read to you. So he sends all of these graduate students. By the way, I love how graduate students are always assigned the most glamorous tasks. In this case, to go to talk to prostitutes in Jersey City. Um, <laughs> And they has them interview them. And it's like, well, why aren't you, what are you doing? Why aren't you just moving two blocks? And they say, uh, here's the kinds of things they would say. I'm in this area. I don't want to move because it'll make it hard on my customers. Or, no, I don't want to build up a business again. I've done it once. I don't want to do it again. Right? Uh, now, our notion our, of what a sex worker is, is someone who has a... Uh, powerful motivation to engage in that kind of work, whether it's they're in an abusive relationship with a pimp, they're driven by 
drug addiction or by poverty or something, we think of people who have a desire and a motivation to engage in this kind of trade, and so for whom moving two blocks would not be a big deal. But what, those, what he finds very quickly is that they're not somehow uh, special in their motivation. In fact, they sound a lot like we do, right? They don't, like, they don't want to move. Why? Because moving's stressful, which is what everyone in this room would say if they were asked to move their business, right? I mean, here's, here's, I'm going to quote to you again. They talked about how hard it would be for business. They'd have to reestablish themselves. They talked about danger, people they don't know. You know, what do they mean by people they don't know? Here I know, what's, I know, who, here I know who's going to call the police and who won't call the police. That's a big issue for them when they're in the same place to begin to have a high level of correct prediction about people. Going to a new place, you don't know who the people are. Right? No, again, they are talking just like businessmen, people with retail operations, people with the kind of businesses all of you people run. That's the way you talk, right? Well, why don't you just move to Dallas tomorrow and start trying to open a real estate firm? Well, because my my, all my contacts are here, all of my knowledge is here, all of my local knowledge, my friends are here, my story, you know, my, on and on and on, right? They're speaking the language of normal people and they're saying, I have the same aversion to moving as anywhere else. All right, so if crime, we know point number one of the law of criminal concentration is that crime is located in a few specific areas um, and that those areas are pretty stable. And point number two is that if you crack down on a hot spot, people are, are, you don't get displacement. People won't just pack up and move somewhere else. You'll actually curb the underlying activity you are trying to, to, uh, to defeat. So third thing, are hot spots obvious? Um, in other words, if you drive around a city, can you see intuitively where all of the criminal activity is taking place. Well, I actually tried this. I went to one of Weisberg's uh, co-workers uh, is in Baltimore. Baltimore, as you know, is one of the most dangerous urban areas in the United States. And uh, it has also been, a map has been, a, has been, an analysis has been done of Baltimore and it follows the same rules as everywhere else. Three, three to four percent of the city streets produce 50% or more of the crime. So I drove around Baltimore for a day with a criminologist and she would drive me to a random block, she would stop the car, and she would say, is this a hot spot or not? Right? And we kept track of my guesses. How good was I at picking out the 4% of streets where all the crime is? And the answer is, I was terrible. Right? Now, some times you know, you go to a, occasionally when you drive around Baltimore, you'll see a pristine street where there are children playing and the lawns are all mowed and the houses are all freshly painted and the old folks are on, are in uh, rocking chairs on their front porches, and you pretty much know, okay, that's not a crime hotspot, right? Those are the easy ones. But the rest is really, really difficult. You can see bombed out places and you would swear that boarded up windows, and you would swear that this is a place where there's a terrible amount of crime, and there isn't. And at the same time, you will see neighborhoods that look totally normal, and then the criminologist would tell me, actually, there were 150 police calls on that block in the last 12 months, 150, right? That's insane. That's one police call every three days. There are blocks, individual blocks in Baltimore where there are 300 police calls in a given year. Right? But that, that fact does not advertise itself in the way the place looks. There's some kind of complex dynamic going on underneath the surface that is not immediately obvious, at least to the untrained eye. Right? So what do we make of this? Well. The word that criminologists like Weisberg use to describe this phenomenon is coupling. And what they mean by that is that individuals do not exhibit behaviors independently of the places in which they're operating. In, but in fact, behavior is coupled to place. That when you talk, talk about a crime, in other words, you can't speak about that crime unless you tell me not just what the crime is, but where the crime occurred. Those are the two crucial facts in understanding the nature of that deviant act. Um, now, I think this is, I, not just me, people in the world of criminology think this is an extraordinary observation. In fact, I th and I think they're correct, they think of this as one of the central insights in modern criminology. It turns almost everything we think about crime upside down. It turns 
criminologists who had previously thought of themselves as purely psychologists, it turns them into geographers. It turns them into people who have to all of a sudden think about something they'd never thought about before, which is place right? and the nature of place and the kind of beha behaviors that are created by place. Let me give you another example of, uh, of coupling because once you, understand, once you understand the principle of coupling, you see it everywhere. Um, this one has to do with suicide uh, and the Golden Gate Bridge. So as many of you know, the Golden Gate Bridge, the most famous bridge in America, was opened in 1937. And in the 80 years that it has been, excuse me, in operation, uh, 1,500 people have taken their lives by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. There is no structure in the world that has uh, been witness uh, to more suicides over the last 80 years than the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, it is so bad that I don't know if any of you ever saw a, a documentary called The Bridge where a filmmaker just put a camera at one end of the bridge and just had it run continuously for, I think, six months. And in that time, he recorded 22 suicides. It's one of the most chilling documentaries you'll ever see. But the point is that suicides on the Golden Gate Bridge are routine. They're so routine that you can put a camera on one end and reasonably expect to capture images of not one or two, but dozens of people committing suicide over the course of a given year. Right? So let's ask the same question about the Golden Gate Bridge and suicide that Weisberg asked about the prostitutes of Jersey City. Is there displacement with suicide or is it coupled? Now, in other words, if you were to block people from committing suicide on the Golden Gate Bridge, would you prevent the suicide? Or would they simply move to another bridge and jump off that bridge, right? Which is it? Now, the assumption of the Golden Gate Bridge Authority, the government body that runs the Golden Gate Bridge, is that suicide and the bridge um, are, uh, that is a, a relationship of displacement. Their assumption for years and years and years is that it would be pointless to spend millions of dollars putting up a suicide uh, bridge, a suicide net on the Golden Gate Bridge because uh, you'd spend all that money and you would deface the bridge and all you would do is move people to the Bay Bridge, right? Bay Bridge is a couple miles away. It's all they have to do if they want to jump off a bridge is just drive across town, right? So what's the point? Um, the, now, this is an authority, by the way, which is not opposed to spending money to alter the bridge. They spent millions of dollars putting up a median barrier for cyclists on the bridge, even though no cyclist has ever lost their life on the Golden Gate Bridge. But they felt that was a reasonably good use of public funds because it struck them that there was a strong possibility that someone might lose their life uh, cycling on the Golden Gate Bridge. They spent millions of dollars putting a median barrier between the east and the westbound traffic on the bridge. Why? Because they felt there was a reasonable possibility that someone might get hurt um, in an accident, a car moving from one side to the next. They spent millions of dollars putting up an eight-foot fence at one end so to prevent people from throwing trash over the bridge onto uh, uh, Fort Baker, which is just below the bridge. Why? Because they wanted to prevent people from littering on the bridge, right? They're not opposed to spending money, but when it came to putting up any kind of suicide prevention measure, they said, you know what, it's pointless. And by the way, it's not just them who thought it was pointless. They would, like clockwork, every 10 years, have a public hearing where they would ask the question, well, we just had another 100 suicides this year. Should we, or 50, should we put up suicide prevention measures? And people, the people who would come and testify would overwhelmingly say, no, what's the point, right? I'm going to read you. You can go to the archives of the Golden Gate Bridge Authority and read the public comments. I would say they run nine to one against any kind of suicide prevention measure. Here's a sample. Here's what some one person says. People bent on suicide will find many ways to do away with themselves. Pills, hanging, drowning, cutting arteries, jumping from any other bridge or building. Wouldn't it be much better to spend the money on mental health care for many people instead of worrying about the few that jump off bridges? Right? That's the position that most people take. By the way, not just San Franciscans. From time to time, there have been national public opinion polls where the question is asked, do you think it'd be a good idea if we put up a suicide prevention measure on the Golden Gate Bridge, given that more people have died than anywhere else? 
And what you find is the overwhelming majority of Americans say, no, what's the point? If you want to commit suicide, you're going to commit suicide, right? You'll just move somewhere else. There's not a shortage of tall places to jump off in a city of San Francisco. So when it comes to suicide and the Golden Gate Bridge, we believe in displacement. We don't believe in coupling. So is that the correct position to take? Well, there was a couple years ago, a psychologist, psychiatrist, psychiatrist named Richard Seiden realizes there was a very clever way to test this question. And that is that periodically people jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge get thwarted. Either they jump into the bay and they survive, or they're stopped, someone grabs them before they can jump. And it turns out that there have been, in the years that he was studying, there were 515 people who had been thwarted from jumping off the bridge. So he decided, he said, look, this is a perfect way to test this. If there is displacement, then those 515 should logically have gone on to commit suicide some other way, right? If there's coupling, if they really just wanted to commit suicide at that moment on the Golden Gate Bridge, then very few of them should have gone on to commit suicide some other way. So which is it? Well, the answer is that of those 515 who were thwarted from committing suicide on the Golden Gate Bridge, 25 went on to commit suicide some other way. The overwhelming majority of people, once they were prevented from committing suicide in that moment on that bridge, never tried to take their own life again. There is not displacement of suicide on the Golden Gate Bridge. There is coupling. Right? Now, that's a really hard thing for people to accept. I've just given you all of these examples of people of how the public um, in America writ large, how local people in San Francisco and how the Golden Gate Bridge Authority itself have fought for decades the idea that suicide might be coupled. It just didn't seem to make any sense, right? The intuitive position was that the place that you were trying to commit suicide was irrelevant. You were driven by an impulse and all that we need, all that really mattered was what was going on inside your own mind and heart. That idea was so, so hardwired into the way we thought about suicide that it, it is not until this year, more than 80 years after that bridge was opened, that a suicide uh, uh, prevention net has finally been built. And by the way, it's not just, we're not just blind to this when it comes to suicide, we're also blind to this when it comes to crime. When you talk to police officers and police departments about the law of criminal concentration, most of them will deny it exists. When David Weisberg would come back from walking the 72nd precinct with his fellow officers, he would turn to them in the end and he would say, why are we walking through the whole precinct when the crime only occurs on the same five blocks over and over again? And he says they would look at him like he was crazy. They didn't understand that that's what they were doing. Right? Or think about the arguments we've been having in this country about aggressive policing and things like stop and frisk, right? Why has that become such a controversial issue? It's not because there is something wrong with the idea of police using aggressive measures to get guns off the street. I think many of us would agree that's a good idea. The problem is that the police use those tactics everywhere, right? They use them throughout the bad neighborhoods, what they call the bad neighborhoods. But there are no bad neighborhoods. There are only bad blocks, right? And their failure to understand that this is a tactic that is appropriately only in those very, very small sections of uh, an urban area where the overwhelming majority of crime exists, it, their failure to understand that connection is what has created this issue, made this issue into something as controversial um, as it is we have a very, very hard time wrapping our, our mind around the notion that crime is not everywhere. Crime is a function of very, very specific places and environments. Now, why have I been giving you a long lecture on criminology and public health? Because I think there is a really, really important lesson here for all of you. Why? Because you are custodians of the built environment, right? And when you sit down and you talk about what it means to create built environments for our society, um, I think you talk a lot about the practical implications of that. You know, how are the buildings that we build going to be used? 
I think you talk a lot about the commercial implications of that, right? How can we make money off these kinds of buildings? I think you talk a lot about the aesthetic and the practical implications of it. How can we design these, how best to design these buildings and how best to build them? But I think that we very often gloss over the emotional and psychological implications of what you're doing. Because the built environment matters, not just on some kind of practical or economic or aesthetic level, but it matters in the way, uh, it matters intimately to the way people navigate their own lives, right? You can take, think about what the law of criminal concentration suggests. You could have two people who are equal in every way, but one person happens to live on one of those problematic blocks and as a result may well be disposed to crime. And that same identical person who lives in the 95% of the city, which is totally fine, that person may never commit a crime at all. But think about what it means in terms of suicide. We're so accustomed to thinking of people who are suffering in that way in terms of what is going on inside them selves, right? Inside their hearts and minds. And to think that our only recourse if we want to stop someone from taking their own life is to minister to their own psychological and psychiatric difficulties. But what does the law of coupling tell us? It says we have another option. It says that the, that terrible act is coupled to a place, a specific place. And if we can think about how to make that specific place a safer environment for someone who carries with them all manner of travail and trouble, we can prevent that tragic act from taking place. Now, I've given you two very dark and depressing examples of the importance of the built environment, but you can flip it on its head because we're not just saying that, uh, that problems and deviant behavior are linked to place. What this is telling us is that all manner of fundamental human psychological reactions are linked to the particulars of the places that we inhabit, right? We, you know, we, you can, this kind of thinking I think leads us to ans ask all kinds of really important questions. Is there a way to build a hospital such that the people in the hospital will get well faster? Once you've read through the literature on criminology and the literature on public health and suicides, that's not a crazy question anymore. Right? It makes sense that there would be an intimate connection between the place where you are when you are sick and your response to the medical treatment you receive. Or is there a way to build an apartment building that isn't just beautiful or affordable, but also brings joy to someone's life? Not a crazy question after you've gone through all that stuff about suicide and crime. We now know that people's well-being and choices and behavior is powerfully linked to the immediate particulars of their environment. That's an important question to ask. You know, it strikes me that we've been, we've been doing versions of this when we think about the work environment for people in recent years. We have been asking questions like, uh, you know, open space versus cubicles, or we've is there a way to structure people's work lives so they'll be happier and more productive? Is there a way to pay people so they'll be more connected to the, to the, to the enterprise? Is there a way to structure management so that, that employees will feel like a better, uh, will feel a better part, more, uh, uh, playing a better role in the organization? But I think we can go further with that. And we can ask some really blue sky questions about the spaces we're building for people. Maybe when we're thinking about designing office spaces, the quest questions about light and air and uh, well-being and the feelings that people have when they're in a space, maybe those ought to be the questions that we start with, not the questions that we address at the end of the process. Right? Now, I realize that I had been, this whole talk has ended on a very, very touchy-feely note. Um, and you are not by nature, uh, you do not by nature belong to touchy-feely uh, professions. Um, but I would urge you not to get lost in the nuts and bolts of your professional work. And, don't, and not to lose sight of the fact that human beings don't float around. We're not rootless. We don't, we, we don't, we don't have, we aren't people without ties to our immediate environment. We live in places, we respond to places, we're shaped by places. And the people who build places have a responsibility to think about those issues.
Thank you. I, um, I think I have time for some questions if anyone is, uh, I can't really see. Thank you for the lovely speech. Um, I once heard you say that today, if you want to be a doctor, you have to be in the relationship business. Uh, my dad's an oncologist, and I could not agree more with that. How would you define the, the modern-day developer? Oh, that's an interesting question. So the question is, how would I define uh, the modern-day developer in terms of what a modern-day developer needs to be in terms of what I've been talking about? And, um, uh, well, you know, I think it's the, a lot of what I was saying was that people in your world um, ought to take their roles more seriously. I think what you do matters more even than you realize. That's really what this is about. That, um, like, you know, I gave you, I could have given you 10 examples of coupling between behavior and built environments. I, I only chose two, but once you start going down that list, I mean, let's just start with the Golden Gate Bridge that uh, the person, the engineer who designed that bridge and the people who approved those designs and uh, allocated money funds for the building of that bridge did not take their, uh, did not take full responsibility, did not understand the full implications of what they were doing. They didn't take their job seriously enough. They thought they were building a mechanism for getting from the highlands of, the Marin Highlands to the the island of San Francisco, right? They didn't understand, no, they were doing much more than that. They were creating a permanent part of the landscape of the region that would have a powerful effect on the troubled in that area, right? That's, so what I'm saying is those, they thought they were doing this little narrow thing and they were in fact doing something that was much more crucial and important. And I don't think if that had been properly explained to them back in 1937, they would have been adverse to that understanding of what they were doing as really important. I think that they were just under a misapprehension that they were, they were simply builders and designers and architects. And they didn't understand that there's no such thing as simply a builder or designer and an architect. You're contributing to the fabric of the society in which we lived. Um, so I, I would just say that the modern developer is someone who needs to think big about their role in the world. Hello. Uh, hi. Sorry. You you, uh, you mentioned uh, that when you went around with the criminologist in uh, in neighborhoods with high crime, you uh, you couldn't really identify where the crime was happening. So what was the cause for some blocks having more criminal concentration, and what can we learn from it, especially in doing the right developments in in areas mm -hmm. which are not wealthy, to make sure you know. Yeah. The, the standard of living is right? Uh, really interesting question. Um, we have some, I mean, some of that work is going on now. Um, the, remember, all of these insights are in academic terms, very, very recent. Um, it's only in the last, you know, if you think about it, the, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge is putting up their uh, suicide prevention bridge, their suicide prevention net this year. Um, the uh, police departments are, are, are embracing the implications of the law of criminal concentration, have been doing that in the last five years. So it's, this whole field is brand new. We have some ideas, some of them are obvious, like, you know, that in, uh, 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 you know, where there are not eyes on the street, where there are, where there is inadequate lighting, where there is, um, uh, where there is, uh, where there is, a, like, if you, there's a big, there's a whole sub-literature on bus stops and what happens at bus stops. Because at bus stops, there's all kinds of unusual um, commingling of people um, that creates opp criminal opportunities. But the more, um, the really interesting stuff is stuff that I don't think we fully understand, which is, um, are there subtle features of design, 
um, and uh, uh, that have an influence on people's behavior and mood, among other things. And that's the stuff, that's the really exciting thing that I think people are um, only now trying to kind of um, uh, identify and, and act on. Um, so I, I think it's too early to give a definitive answer to that question, as important as it is. Uh, I, I think, aren't you really suggesting that there are certain like energy vortexes that are conducive to crime, suicide, and perhaps happiness and joy as well? And that buildings create those spaces. Yeah, um, yeah. That's a uh, that's actually a lovely way of putting it. Um, I was afraid of being too touchy feely because I'm the non businessman from, you know, downtown New York. So I, I was. I, th I thought you would all think I was soft if I talked about <laughs> energy vortexes. But I'm glad you have. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I think that's what I mean. I think. There is something, you know, one really, really interesting question is how much does it matter if a space, a building and the space it's in, is beautiful um, and is visually arresting? Is, so, I mean, we know it matters on an aesthetic level, but how much does it matter in terms of the behavior of those who encounter that building and that space? That, to me, is an incredibly important question. And I think what's becoming clear is that maybe there are much larger kind of psychological ramifications to that. Um, that maybe people's responses to something that is ugly um, is, um, is in some way um, uh, uh, participates in a, in a decision to make a, uh, take a deviant step. And on the flip side, maybe there's something about a beautiful space that invites good behavior. Um, or joy or anything like that. Um, that's, that, that's to me what's so exciting about this, um, this kind of work. Hello. Um, thank you so much for being here. I've been looking forward to hearing you speak in Miami for a while. I wanted to follow up on the, this discussion um, I remember hearing um, when I think Charles Montgomery was <coughs> at the BMW Guggenheim uh, lab that was traveling around from different cities. Um, uh, they ran an, ex an experiment where they had people stand on a block and look at the other side of the, of the street. And it was either uh, a, a street that had one giant building occupying the, the whole other side of the street or like five, six, ten building, little buildings. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they said, how, you know, how, how engaged or how connected do you feel to this neighborhood based on what you're looking at? And um, the blocks with lots of little buildings, people felt more engaged with the neighborhood and connected with the community. Um, and so that, I think it's that kind of data gathering and looking into the, the aspects of the built environment that can make people feel connected socially or Mm -hmm. you know, connected with the community or engaged. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, so I, was, I would be curious to know what your peers in the room in the real estate development business think of the observation that many small buildings on one block are preferable to one large one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, no, that's super interesting. You know what also I'm, I'm reminded of? There is another sub-literature on one-way streets. Um, that uh, one of the things that distinguishes um, crime hotspots is they do tend disproportionately to be on one-way streets. Uh, one-way streets are not a, a good idea um, from a number of different, uh, they're, they increase traffic efficiency at substantial cost to other things. Um, so there are a number of, there are all kinds of little quirky factors that I feel like we need to be paying more attention to um, that, uh, that can c contribute to these kinds of um, uh, positive or uh, negative feelings. Is coupling something that is only experienced at the human scale or can you view it more at a macro level? For example, you saying that Baltimore has a higher crime rate than somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, I think you can play, I think it is reasonable to assume that you should be able to see coupling at many different, on many different uh, levels. Um, that uh, 
you know, a, a really, I mean, you're raising a really interesting question, which is that, um, is it possible that built environments on a, on a citywide scale might have this kind of malign effect on populations? And that's super interesting, and I think also probably um, supportable. I mean, a lot of this, you know, what's interesting about these d discussions is that they take us back to um, urban planning perspectives and debates of a generation ago, where I feel like people were asking these questions, but they didn't give us good answers. In fact, they gave us bad answers. Um, but I think it, maybe it's time to revisit some of those questions and try to come up with better um, answers. But the idea that um, that uh, you you uh, that we know all we need to know about the consequences of um, how space is organized and built out is nonsense. We're, this is something, this is virgin territory. Um, and this, the, the crime concentration stuff, I cannot impress a, enough upon you how weird it is. Nobody in the entire world of criminology would have guessed that that's what crime looked like. Um, and for, for generations, you know, police officers worked the streets of cities and they never, it never occurred to them this was going on. There was just, it just didn't make any sense. It was a, there was a big blind spot. Um, so that, that kind of thing suggests to me that there's a lot of real weirdness out there uh, waiting to be uncovered in, um, in your world. <laughs> so we're gonna, need to, we're gonna need to wrap up now. Okay. I'm gonna get the last question in now because we do ask, we've asked everybody today and um, we're gonna pose the same question to you. You've got students from all different uh, backgrounds here, MBAs, real estate developments, construction, architecture, urban design. What advice do you have to them as they venture, as they complete their studies and venture out into the world, into their careers? Um, advice for, well, I mean, I suppose, I thought I just gave advice. I guess I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can give more. There's a limit to how much advice. Um, but, uh, well, you know, this, so this, so I guess, well, let me give advice to the universe, since we are at a university function. What does this say about the way we ought to educate um, uh, people l looking to enter these professions? And I will, I'm reminded of a, um, uh, of a study that I read um, a few months ago. That was, I, this is another di digression. I have a cousin who is the, editor of the leading scientific journal in the world of ophthalmology. Um, that sounds very nerdy, and it is. Um, and he assigned me this to write this little editorial on a study in ophthalmology. And what they did was, you know, ophthalmologists are tasked with making, um, with reading, you know, they take pictures of the eye and various, and they have to make sophisticated diagnoses on the basis of what they see. And what the study did was, is it took a group of medical students who were doing training, their, their um, specialty training in ophthalmology, and instead of giving them their, in some portion of their instruction in the med school, it made them go down the street to the art museum, this is in Philadelphia, to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and to take a course in, um, in um, art appreciation to learn where they were taught how to look at art. And then it took those kids who had been taught how to look at art, brought them back, and tested them, tested their diagnostic skills against their uh, peers who had been taught entirely within the medical school. What did they discover? They discovered, as you can imagine, that the kids who had been sent to do art appreciation were vastly better diagnosticians than their peers who had instead spent all that time in the med school. What that tells us is that um, in the, as the kind of problems that professionals are facing grow more complex, and the task of an ophthalmologist today is infinitely more complex than it was a generation ago. You're asking questions and answering questions that never occurred to your, you know, the generation or two that came before you. As these problems go, grow more complex, the benefits of interdisciplinary preparation become greater. And so I think that what, when we think about, when we work backwards from these kinds of observations, what we need to be saying is that if someone is to be a truly effective developer or architect or do anything in these professions, um, they need to have a broader perspective on society. They need to be 
have people who have thought about and been trained in the humanities and have read literature and history and have just some other, something that they can bring to their profession from the broader world that, um, that prepares them for these kinds of much more um, uh, complex and consequential questions. How's that for advice? Thank you all. Bye -bye. <laughs>